The Church of England has published new guidance to help trans people mark their transition and rededicate their lives within the faith. It says existing liturgy should be adapted to affirm those who have undergone transition. In Advent 2019, mm. the bishops released their pastoral guidance on how to use the service of rebaptism, or indeed if you read the footnotes, the service of baptism, to celebrate a transgender uh, person's change to their bodies. Now, at that point I realized, 2019, the House of Bishops have authorized mm. us to use a sacrament mm. to celebrate transgenderism. And I just, I immediately knew when I read that document that was emailed to me, mm. you know, well, I need to leave the Church of England now because the people who are properly speaking in authority, the bishops, mm. not only a couple of years ago did they make clear we have to have different views on the sexuality issue, mm. they've now actually sort of, while lots of evangelicals thought we need to prepare for the problem of same-sex blessings, mm. actually the House of Bishops have sort of tested the waters to see how people respond by doing something arguably even more extreme, yes. using a sacrament to celebrate transgenderism. I think a lot of a lot of Church of England ministers, they get emails from their bishops, they become a little bit aware of what's going on, but it's actually so bad, they can't share it to their congregations. Really? You have to be able to navigate and deal with the problems the Church of England is presenting you because they are merely a subsection of, merely even a test case for dealing with the tsunami that's coming mm. of an, an aggressive woke culture, which has very strong views on, on race, on sexuality, mm on on what it means to, to live with integrity and that and that, that is increasingly allied with laws and authoritarian government structures which will enforce that in schools on families on churches mm. so in a very real sense yeah. the spiritual cultural issues of our day mm. are what christian ministers really need to take the lead on being able to navigate the church of england and find a way to deal with that mm. that is merely the test case for something much much harder feel at that the yeah. Church of England, you, you will really struggle with what's coming. Yeah. The, the verse that other people repeatedly mentioned to me as I was in the process of providing for our mm. people mm. to leave was the verse from Samuel uh, that the Lord honours those who honour him. Mm. And I'm not exaggerating to say at least five people shared that verse to me independent of one another. You know, they share one verse and that's the verse they share. The Lord honours those who honour me. And we find it to be true. You know, it has been a joy to serve the gospel, to see people come to faith, to, to, to pastor and counsel, um, knowing that one of the greatest challenges of our time has, in our small little corner of the vineyard, has been dealt with. Good day, my friends, and welcome back to Evangelical Platform, a ministry dedicated to preserving the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in this complicated, messy, postmodern world. Friends, today I have the great joy of seeing my friend Dr. Peter Sandin again. We met a couple of years ago. Yep. Uh, he left the Church of England. He read theology at Oxford. He did his doctorate at Cambridge uh, on Augustine. And uh, he has planted a church here in... Tunbridge Wells. Tunbridge Wells. And the first sermon was preached by who? Ah, well, yes, that's a nice uh, little piece of history that uh, while our church was planted in uh, 2020, um, we called it Emmanuel because we viewed it as a relaunch of a, of a church that was established many years ago during the Great Revival here in Tunbridge Wells. And the first preacher was George Whitfield, who preached at the opening service of that church before his final trip to America, where he, he went to glory. So that church existed in Tunbridge Wells for many years through to the late 1970s. Um, when it was closed down to make way for a um, hospital uh, car park and uh, sort of little uh, avenue into the car park. So that was sad to lose that church. But in a sense, the vision of that church is, is really our vision to preach the gospel with the warm hearted passion that people like Whitfield had, um, faithful to God. But actually, as was that church uh, that he founded outside the official church of the Church of England. Wonderful. That was 1769. I checked that. That's quite quite some time ago. Now, now I'm so excited about today because I think it's a treat for some of my Christian friends who are at this point battling 
progressive liberal theology in mainline churches. Maybe you are struggling. Maybe you're at that point where you have to make a decision. And Peter, he made that decision a couple of years ago. We're going to talk about his ministry. Uh, he wrote a chapter in a book of IVP recently where he narrates his whole journey. So, so today we really want to talk a bit about that, a bit about his background, how he came to faith, how he grew up, and advice that he can give you if you are struggling with this issue at this stage. So, so Peter, let's start. Uh, you got a call for ministry when you were 17. You grew up in a Christian home. You lived in America, in Malaysia, in Ireland. Just give us a bit of an overview of uh, that whole mm. phase in your life. Thanks, Frederick. Um, yeah, and I think I think this whole issue that, that the IVP book, you know, my chapter in that IVP book deals with of, of leaving the Church of England as a minister or with a church and stuff, I think it is of significance to more than just Church of England ministers because the spiritual issues, the doctrinal issues that are being wrestled with are actually fracturing and tearing apart families, schools, businesses across the Western culture. So um, churches and church ministers need to learn how to deal with them in order to look after and shepherd people in their churches across all of the areas of life. It's not just a technical issue for church ministers. Um, but yeah, you ask about um, how I became a Christian, my background, uh, raised in a church-going family. And uh, yeah, my, my family traveled a lot. So my, I went to 11 different primary schools in three different continents. Wow. Um, and uh, you know, my, my main memory as, as a child was sort of leaving where we lived and saying goodbye to people. Um, helped make me the well-adjusted, friendly person I am today. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then the majority of my childhood then after primary school was spent living in Northern Ireland. And uh, when I was 16, I visited a church where the minister had learned from people like John Stott and Dick Lucas, the art of expository preaching. Mm -hmm. And I was certainly a Christian when I visited this minister's church. But, but when I heard him preach, I realized I was hearing something different to what I'd ever heard before. Um, yeah, I was 16, nearly 17. Um, the sermon was on the last chapter of Second Timothy. Um, Paul in prison, go fetch my, my scrolls, my cloaks. Um, and you would think, I remember thinking, you know, this doesn't look like it's really that profound or meaningful, but I was nevertheless greatly struck by the power and the authority um, that resided in the preacher and the message he shared. And, and within the course of that sermon, I, I felt a, a strong call from the Lord that I should be in full-time ministry preaching like that so that other people could benefit as I knew I was benefiting. Mm -hmm. I, I really wanted then from that point on to be involved in church ministry to help people experience the joy of knowing God through the preached word okay. um, in that way. Okay, take us then to reading theology at Oxford. Did you encounter critical scholarship? Uh, well, yeah. How did you cope with that? Yeah, so obviously most people don't go and do theology. You know, most people who end up being church ministers don't study theology as their primary degree. That That's unusual. But I just felt, you know, I'd, I'd done A-level RE mm -hmm. as as a way to, I thought to myself, I've got to do three A-levels. If, if one third of them is on the topic of the Bible, at least that gives me more time to read the Bible, whatever's being taught. And, and I did that and benefited from it. Um, the A-level course back then was very traditional where I was studying, you know, the, the set texts were Romans, Galatians 1 and 2, Corinthians, and, you know, Bible Speaks Today commentaries were necessary reading. Um, You're fortunate. <laughs> it was very unusual, I think, very unusual, but very beneficial. And I just thought, well, why not, why not extend that thinking? You know, if I have to go to university, why not spend more time reading the Bible there? So I, I enrolled to study theology at Oxford. And as a credentialed theologian yourself, you quite rightly point out that the theology taught at Oxford is is not what people like you and me actually believe and preach. You know, it's it is it, it, it when I studied there it was it was the classical liberal arts, liberal theology degree. Um I was aware of that before I went. I'd been warned about it and, and I tried to mitigate it a, a bit by by studying at Wycliffe Hall uh, rather than um one of the normal colleges and that meant that I had around me other people who were Christians trained to be ministers I had more ability to shape my degree I was able to speak to the teachers and ask for particular lectures and stuff to, to supervise my studies they were very supportive in that way so I had a great time I was I, I was taught by people like David Wenham in New mm. Testament and Professor McCulloch in the Reformation and Calvin um, Thomas Wynandy in Patristics you know mm. they were great years 9801 in Oxford were great years to study theology there actually and um, the degree course was the same degree course pretty much mm. as had been taught half a century earlier it hadn't really changed much the mm. basic requirements the basic course outline 
some of the teachers actually seem to use the same lecture notes from 50 years before, but that's, that's another story. Um, <laughs> How did you cope with critical scholarship, Bultmann, form criticism, Dodd? Yep. So, for, so yeah, you certainly had to read and study those theologians, and I did. Um, and I, I found it quite easy to email um, teachers around the world in other seminaries, America, Australia, and just say, hi, I'm studying theology at Oxford. My lecturers give me the list of 10 Oxford, books. By the way. Yeah, it, it did it. Okay, I didn't know. <laughs> and, you know, my teachers are telling me this, and they gave me these books to read. Could you help me? And I find people incredibly helpful. You know, people would people in other places around the world would send me reading lists. Were college? Uh, yes, they were very helpful. Um, as were some people who at the time were teaching at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in America. The A. Carson was um, he there at the time? Or? He was. Mm. He was. And um, so I just and I remember thinking at the time, you know, this is this is kind of like the Reformation actually that the reformers had unusual views, they were in a minority, but they wrote letters around the world to seek help. You know, they advised each other. Yes. And, and I just thought, well, these people seem willing to help me understand these problems. I'll, I'll read their books. And, and mm. I, I, I studied and mm. enjoyed the course. Right. Theologically, what I would say about the Oxford course, looking back now, is mm. that, one, it is more useful and better for a Christian student then than it is now, because I think the courses have been changed to make it more of a kind of choose whatever you want type course. Mm. Um, there's a lot more emphasis on other religions. And so, so the classic old fashioned Christian theology degree, as I understand it, mm. that's, that's not so easy to get now. Mm. Um, but the lack in it mm. was the lack of systematic theology, which ultimately became my area of speciality. Yeah. You know, yeah. there was no, no desire or ability or understanding of how to pull all areas of knowledge together mm under a, a coordinating yes. submission to the doctrine of scripture. Can I just say, the, uh, w one of the dogmatic professors in South Africa who studied uh, in the Netherlands at the Free University, when he retired, he said that's one of the great uh, problems you see with reformed theological seminaries, that the fragmentation, uh, yep. the specialities, and there's no way of bringing it all together. And, and pastors often can specialize in one thing, but they struggle to bring it all together yep. for preaching and, and, and so forth. Yeah, you have to work quite hard to do that, and there are ways to do that in seminary education. Um, I've recently been delighted to accept a post of adjunct professor of systematic and historical theology at Westminster Seminary Wonderful. in Newcastle, which is a confessional Presbyterian seminary. Mm. And and at that seminary, God is calling you back to your roots. Who who knows? I'm who joking. knows? <laughs> but um, what's what's helpful there is that that because we're confessional, mm. all of the teachers are involved in local church ministry and they all mm. uphold the same doctrinal standards yes. and and that has to apply across all faculties you can't have mm. well it happens and i've seen it in colleges i've studied in the ethics professor teaching one thing the new testament professor teaching another thing and the professor of church history teaching something else you know you need to all be uh, united mm. and then the different disciplines cooperate right. together yeah let's go okay. to your let's go to your cambridge years then you did a infill yeah. and a doctorate in yes. uh, in systematic theology on on augustine yes um was that interesting what did you learn from augustine that you think then mm. that can make a contribution for us in systematics well so that was the years oh five to ten and um, i was also doing my ordination training for the Church of England. Um, I initially wanted to do my academic studies on Jonathan Edwards and his teaching on the affections because I felt that, that the need to engage more deeply in the heart and the, the, the heartfelt religion which he preached, I, I could see that that was real genuine Christianity and I wanted to grapple with that more. But as I, as I began to research options, I realized that an awful lot of very capable American students had already written PhDs in Jonathan Edwards. And <laughs> it was going to be very difficult to satisfy the originality requirement for a doctorate. Sure. So then I realized that, um, that that strand of affectionate, heartfelt theology in the Christian church, which has always been present at different stages of church history, but is often then opposed and ridiculed, um, only to resurface in a revival or some great theologian mm. uh, like Whitfield or Edwards or somebody. It actually traces itself back to the theology of Augustine. That, that in Augustine you saw a man who, who spoke of the restless heart and, and the need to have a big love for God. And so I realized, well, let's, let's go back and study Augustine. And then I found that his, his, his 
his expository sermons, his 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 sermons, which were not collected together in a, in a commentary series, mm. they were sort of unedited by him. He intended to tidy them up, but, but he never did. And as a result, you have this 10 or 11 volumes that are on a bookshelf there behind me somewhere um, of sermons that he preached that were recorded, which are like the unedited thing. They, they include the statements about, you know, I'm feeling a bit tired now. I think we'll take a break or, you know, I'm sorry, it's a bit hot today or you know, we wish the noise and the gladi gladiators behind us would pipe down a bit, but, you know, they're going to keep on fighting. The gladiators? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was a big ethical issue for the day. Lots of, you know, some Christians thought it was okay to go to the gladiatorial games and others didn't, and Augustine was strongly opposed to it, of course. Mm -hmm. um, Very interesting. Mm, so, yeah, so I did a PhD on Augustine's sermons, asking the question, what did Augustine believe when he was preaching? Um, what did he understand the work of preaching to involve? Oh, well, so, you must have enjoyed that. I did, I did. And, I, I, you know, I was privileged to study under uh, David Ford, who at the time was the Regis Professor of Divinity. Mm. Yes. And, you know, he was a very sympathetic and capable tutor and guide. Mm. Um, we disagreed on some foundational issues, of course, but I realised when I began to meet him and talk with him that I was dealing with a man who, who was um, humble, who was incredibly knowledgeable and could challenge and push me to to read widely and learn. And I, I really appreciated the time with him. And he said to me fairly early, early on, look, you're doing a PhD. It will, it will be a snapshot in time of where scholarship is at. That's one thing for sure. But more importantly for you, you are apprenticing yourself to the person you're studying. And, and that's how I viewed it. It was a spiritual process of being a disciple of Augustine and learning to live as a Christian from him. Mm. And I, I like to think, I hope that I have maintained that, that I am, I am basically at heart an Augustinian Christian. Yeah. So, Peter, let's jump gear and go to this chapter that you've written for this new IVP mm. book, uh, Clear Blue Water, Leaving the Church of England and Alternative Anglicanisms. I in, enjoyed reading this. Mm -hmm. And I want to give you a couple of quotes and then you can try to unpack that. You, you, you then became ordained in the Church of England. You've been a, a, a minister. You've really tried to transform the church from the inside over a number of years. And if eventually, in 2019, you, re you resigned from the Church of England. Yes. So, uh, quotation from your chapter. The Church of England is not a secure place for gospel faithfulness. Many in the senior leadership of the CFE prefer to call on people to ignore sin and place their faith in the secular culture's ideals. Mm -hmm. You want to unpack that for us, for people who do not really know the Church of England? Well, the Church of England is the, the National State Church of England and um, has many ministers and congregation members in it who, who love the Lord Jesus Christ and are faithful. But it is an institution. It is it is a structured organisation, and um, structured organisations drive change and embody visions for life that actually have real power. Um, so, while one may like to think, you know, the Church of England is my experience of the church I go to and my minister, who's a lovely minister and preaches very well and is faithful. The reality is, whether you realize it or not, all around that church, there's a massive structure. One of the largest institutions in the country, you know, a massive institution, massive landowner, massive business. And the way that organization is run and what is permitted, not permitted in it does have an impact. And ultimately, in the end, um, that little church and that faithful ministry will be either crushed or supported by the changes that happen in the wider institution. And I think that for quite a number of years, because it's a national state church, the church, and I'm, I'm thinking now of from World War II mm. through to the uh, 80s, the Church of England, broadly speaking, mirrored British culture. And British culture, broadly speaking, was quite sympathetic or accepting of the Christian religion. Um, you know... Uh, it, for a large part of the decades I've just mentioned, um, the average person who went along to a school in England would hear the Lord's Prayer regularly said, would have a Christian assembly in school, would grow up familiar with Bible stories like the story of Jonah, the story of Adam and Eve. You know, our culture had many vestiges of Christianity being shared throughout it. And the Church of England mirrored that and, and lived with that and 
and benefited from that. But I think things began to change uh, quite dramatically mm. in 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 the nineties and, and accelerated mm. in in the in the two thousands very dramatically. Can I intersect this? So in sixty three, you had J. T. Robinson, honest to God, the Archbishop yes. still criticised that. But then it looks like in the late sixties, you had the Doctrine Commission. You had J. I. Packer, uh, you know, the evangelicals on that commission. They altered the Declaration of Assent. Yeah that future vicars have to ascribe to. And then you've got a number of interesting test cases. You have the myth of God, where yep. the virgin birth, the miracles, the atonement yes. was rejected. You had Hugh Montefiore, uh, a bishop of Birmingham, who supported the book. You had Geoffrey Lamp from Cambridge, yep. who stood up at Synod. Then you had David Jenkins, who openly rejected the empty tomb. Yes. Uh, and then you had other academics like Don Cupid at, at Cambridge. And it seems like from that point you had... When it, not not sexual ethics, but but doctrinal issues that mm. were compromised. Would yep. that be a fair assessment? Yes, but the significant thing and the significant point that I was alluding to in mm. my quote, which you read about yeah. the institution, is that all of the men you mentioned there and the vignettes you paint, and you could add others, like you could also add in like Bishop Henley Henson, who pioneered the idea that you can assent to the Apostles' Creed, but but not sort of actively believe it. And you could sort of, therefore, sort of, you know, in a sense, sign the forms with a sort of uh, an empty faith that meant you didn't have to go into the details. So you could you could mention all these people, but the significant thing about all those people you mentioned and others is that up until up until about the two thousands, mm. they were all individual radicals, individual mm. men or bishops or academics saying things that were patently outside the bounds of true passionate, full-blooded, orthodox Christian religion. Mm. And they were rightly seen as outliers and they were criticised by many within the church. Yes, And they, they had not done what has happened now. They had not seen their views and the implications of them embedded in the very institutional structures of the Church of England. That, that's the crucial thing that happened in the 2000s. Right. We move away from radical individuals saying things that are untrue to an institution which has effectively been colonised by uh, wrong views, which still has faithful ministers and congregations in it, mm. but whether they realise it or not, they will inevitably be stomped upon by an institution which has yeah. which has seeded the ground. So you have really worked hard trying to reform the church from the inside. You've written a, a number of very, very strong, powerful articles mm. over the years. Uh, and when you re resigned, it was quite big news. I think Christian Concern did a video. I've checked it the other week. I think more than 80,000 people have watched that. Right. The video we did three years ago, is, is that's my most popular video. I think more than 10,000 people have watched it. Mm. Um, do you want to just tell us your attempts to reform and maybe one or two things that happened that brought you to the point of saying, mm. it's time to move? Mm. So... Um, I was an incumbent, a senior minister in the Church of England here in Tunbridge Wells for six and a half to seven years. And my main focus was taking a church and, and turning it around from from decline and um, to turn it into a growing, vibrant uh, evangelical church, which we saw happen. You know, it, it was it was, you know, by the end of that time. From one perspective, I would have loved to have stayed. It was it was a great church. You know, it was mm. it was a great evangelical church that. Anybody that moved to the area would be welcome to come and join in with, and there was Beautiful plenty of things to do. Well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, it was, you know, in a very real sense, we had everything the Church of England has to offer a Church of England minister. You know, a, a lovely big grade two star listed Victorian building that sat on top of a hill that looked down on the town. So if anybody wanted to come to visit this, the church, you could just say, well, you know, just drive into the town and look up, and there's a hill, and, you know, come to the spire. That's where we are. It was glorious and really lovely. And, you know, we would have looked forward to big building projects and stuff. So, in that sense, my focus was normal parish ministry. You know, we had a staff team, we had apprentices, um, all that usual stuff. Mm. But um, I could see that, that the, there were challenges on the horizon for a faithful ministry in the Church of England. While I wanted to stay there till retirement, I could see there was going to be challenges. I worked to alert ministers and people in the Church of England to it by writing many articles and so forth as, as you've alluded to but also people you know I I, I organised and rallied people got 
got all the local conservative ministers and representatives from their congregations together in big meetings to share information with them about mm. what was going on in the Church of England. Mm. Uh, numbers of the ministers, when I met them, said they were scared to tell their congregations what was really going on because they either wouldn't believe it or would feel they were just being negative. So I said, well, let's, let me help you get them all together and, and we'll share it together. Evangelical. Evangelicals, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because mm. yeah. that, that's a problem that I think a lot of a lot of Church of England ministers, they get emails from their bishops, they become a little bit aware of what's going on, but it's actually so bad they can't share it to their congregations. Really? So, you know, if you share it to your congregations, then the congregation can begin to get grumpy and say, well, you're being so negative, why do you just get on with organising next week's service? They don't see the institutional structures and how it's going to ultimately stomp on the church, you know, if you don't deal with it. So it's very difficult. And I felt, you know, when I visited some of the ministers around this region, you know, two of them were in tears when I asked them, how are you doing? You know, how are you coping with these issues? You know, and so so it, what you, when I was involved in the Church of England, I wasn't just writing articles and sending them out on the internet. You know, we got involved with real people, real mm. churches. And when, for example, Archbishop Foley Beach came to visit the country to talk to evangelicals mm. about the situation in the Church of England, the best way for him to get a load of concerned, active people together was to come and speak at our church to, mm. to the ministers and their congregations that we gathered. Mm. And so, so we made real efforts. But but what was it? You know what happened that sort of led somebody like me to step away from the Church of England, which I loved and and which I was a part of. Well, in twenty thirteen, uh, the Pelling Report was published. Mm. I remember, quite notorious. So the Pilling Report, um, there's probably a copy on a bookshelf behind me here. Um, very large, you know, a couple of inches thick when you print what it out. What was the most controversial bit in that report that really had this huge concerns all across England? What was most controversial about it doesn't matter because it was never going to be implemented. So it, the Pilling Report made many recommendations to how the Church of England should navigate the homosexuality disputes mm. in culture. And it did make some pretty radical rec recommendations. Mm. But I went to visit the Bishop of Rochester at the time, James Langstaff, and he, he chatted to me over coffee and said, look, Peter, you know, in the end, you know, I, I think we'll just take this report and push it into the long grass. It won't really happen. It's too controversial. I said, oh, OK, fair enough. And it was. The Pilling Report is a report which was never accepted or, or voted on within the Church of England. There's no official standing in the Church of England, and yet institutions change on the basis of reports and plans which are never actually Slowly, implemented. Slowly, over time. Yeah. So one of the many recommendations the Pilling Report made was the setting up of something called shared conversations, opportunities for people who took different views on the sexuality crisis to come together and understand each other. Shared conversations. And that recommendation from the Pilling Report was implemented. Mm. And those conversations happened from 2013, 2014, for a few years in the Church of England. So all around the Church of England, these big meetings were organised. People were invited from churches and dioceses, ministers, lay people, get together. And, 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 and carefully structured, organised meetings were held where different people's views were shared. Yeah. I went on one of them. Mm. I went on the one for Rochester and some of the other dioceses. Mm. It was a very enlightening experience. Um, I was really surprised to find that when I talked with people who took a different view to me on the sexuality crisis, how open many of them were about taking a different view on things like heaven and hell, the authority of scripture, atonement. the nature of evangelism, the nature of the atonement. Mm. And I suddenly realized that insights from men like Gresham Macon uh, in previous generations were quite right, that we were not dealing with one issue that people take different views on, however serious or not you think that is, mm. we were actually dealing with a, a religion where everything is systematically, organically related. And when you pull on one thread, inevitably, everything else collapses around it. So that was one of my big insights from that experience. But the other big thing was the shared conversations mm. were designed and structured, and the experience of being on them was all about compelling people to accept the fact that these different views were acceptable and should be tolerated and embraced within the one institution. That as we met on this sort of three or four day conference together, we were actually having a shared conversation. And I realized afterwards that the practice of the shared conversations going on had in effect begun to turn the Church of England into one big shared conversation. Yes. And moving forwards, I think that's what happened, that, that, that the the ministry of Justin Welby in the Church of England 
his great contribution to the Church of England has been to turn it into one big shared conversation, where under him, it is acceptable to have different views on the most controversial issue of the day, the sexuality issues. Mm. Issues which I believe the Bible is very clear on which view is right and which view is wrong. So, 2017, um, now I'm doing all this from memory now off the cuff, so forgive me if I make a mistake on dates, but I'm pretty sure it was 2017, mm. February 2017, uh, there was a debate called a take note debate in Synod. Take note debates would normally be used for minor bureaucratic issues, you know, like, you know, we we need to tidy up some little aspect of our procedures. We'll just take note of this. Mm. But the House of Bishops um, put forward a paper for a take note debate, which effectively put forward the idea that, that there were different views on the sexuality crisis in the Church of England. And these different views should be accepted and celebrated and the people that take the different views should bless those who take different view to them. And this was just to be a take note debate. So it was it was argued that taking note of this paper will not in any way um, change the Church of England or change the doctrine of the Church of England. It's just an acknowledgement that there's there's different ways to look at this. Um, the paper was partly written by a steering committee, a reflection group, which included conservatives like Bishop Rod Thomas of, of Maidstone. And he strongly argued in emails that the evangelicals should support the take note debate. And, and it was in the event voted for by all of the bishops of the House of Bishops. So the entire House of Bishops voted for the take note motion to celebrate the different views on the sexuality crisis in the Church of England. The motion didn't actually pass because not enough lay people voted for it. But that's, a, that's remarkable if you think the lay people wouldn't vote it in, but the bishops wanted to vote yeah. it in. And I, I thought as a minister in the Church of England with responsibility for a church, I just thought this is very significant. And it, it felt to me like this is, this is kind of how God works as well. He, he allows things to happen that you have to have eyes to see. You have to be willing to understand what he is permitting to happen in his world. Uh, God doesn't just sort of write it all out in a black and white sort of way that overwhelms everybody. You have to have eyes to see. You have to be open to the spirit. You have to discern the times. And I think God also has a sense of humor that there's something in a pathetic, sad way, quite amusing about the entire House of Bishops being united in celebrating diverse views on sexuality, but losing their vote. And for me as a minister, I just thought, in the Church of England, it is Episcopally governed. You know, my ministry is supposed to be overseen and supported by this House of Bishops, and they have united together in making very clear that their views are doctrinally aberrant. Surely this is significant. So I, I stepped up my efforts to sort of alert people to these problems and dangers um various meetings with evangelical ministers um drafting strategy papers for di various different movements trying to lead some kind of fight back in the church of england um and in a sense i thought that was all continuing with ups and downs and with various weaknesses there was a tendency of some evangelical leaders to think that Having a cliche was adequate. You know, if you come up with a with a phrase that will rally evangelicals, you know, whatever it is, you know, it used to be impaired communion, mm. um, unavoidable avoidance, uh, temporal or spiritual approaches to ministry. You know, you come up with a phrase and you share it to people, and that makes everybody feel we've we've got a strategy. You don't have a strategy; you've just got a you just got a phrase. So that was that. That, that strand of the evangelical response was, was a weakness during these years. But at the same time, there were positive signs of evangelicals trying to grapple with the theology of what it means to be a minister in the Church of England, what it means to be faithful, the nature of a denomination. That was all going on. So in a sense, I felt there wasn't any big emergency. But then, of course, in Advent 2019, mm. the bishops released their pastoral guidance on how to use the service of rebaptism, or indeed, if you read the footnotes, the service of baptism, to celebrate a transgender uh, person's change to their bodies. Now, at that point, I realized 2019, the House of Bishops have authorized mm. us to use a sacrament mm. 
to celebrate transgenderism. And I just, I immediately knew when I read that document that was emailed to me, mm. you know, well, I need to leave the Church of England now because the people who are properly speaking in authority, the bishops, mm. not only a couple of years ago did they make clear we have to have different views on the sexuality issue, mm. they've now actually sort of, while lots of evangelicals thought we need to prepare for the problem of same-sex blessings, mm. actually the House of Bishops have sort of tested the waters to see how people respond by doing something arguably even more extreme, yes. using a sacrament to celebrate transgenderism. I remember at the time I, I noted with a friend that you could actually then have now a man who becomes a woman, who marries another woman. So it's yes. very interesting. Can I That's just right. I just yeah. want to read one paragraph from that guidance uh, that was published the 11th of December 2018. Quote, The pastoral guidance for clergy on how to use the right of affirmation of baptism faith in the context of gender transition. Now, just hang on there. Mm. That suggests the words how to use in the context of suggest they're going to alter the meaning, the original meaning of of this liturgy yes. to mean something it has never ever meant before. Absolutely, yes, yes. It, so that's it, it, changing it, the doctrine, actually. Well, I believe so, yes. And and a lot of you know the problem is that when people are determined to stay in the Church of England no matter what, and and will not see the way the institution will will crush your local church ministry unless you deal with it effectively. Um, they will seek all kinds of ways to tell themselves a change that has happened has not really happened. Mm -hmm. And so the argument becomes, well, the actual doctrine of the Church of England has not changed because, you know, it's not been voted through in, in some big particular way or it's not been included in the actual service books which are published by Church House. Um, or because there is another rule or definition of marriage or the sacraments in another part of the rules of the Church of England, and that still exists on a bit of paper somewhere in a filing cabinet. You know, you can come up with all kinds of arguments to convince yeah. yourself nothing's changed if you don't want to see it. Can I just come in there? Because I remember being at, you know, your church a number of years ago, and, and there are so many ministers and pastors who have this argument, we will stay for as long as the confessions are intact or we are still allowed to, to preach the gospel. Mm. Um, the problem I think the reformers had with that in the Belgian confessions, the, the homilies uh, in the Church of England, the official homilies, actually say that there are three signs or markers for a, for a, a Protestant church. Do you just want to mention that for us and just unpack some of that? So the, th the, the, the marks of a Christian church... From one perspective, some of the reformers made the very astute point that there is, in a sense, one mark of a true Christian church, and that is the Word of God. That the Word of God, its reality and its power, when it's manifest and exhibited and embraced, there the true church is. But then the Word of God has different forms. The Word of God, the Word of God is presented through the preached Word and the written Word. It's also preached visibly through the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. So the reformers quite rightly said, in another perspective, there are two marks of the Christian church, the word and the sacraments. When they are rightly used and rightly handled and rightly exhibited, there the true church is. But then, of course, some of the reformers made the point from another perspective. Um, if you have those two marks of the church, but it's all just pretend and it's not real. If people are free to take different views than the true view, then you don't really have those things. And therefore, there is, from another perspective, a third mark of the Christian church, which is discipline. Mm. That, that the order of the church and the teaching of the church must actually be upheld in reality, not just on paper. And so, properly speaking, there are three marks of the Christian church. The word, the sacraments, and discipline. And in a very real sense, you know, each of the second and the third marks of the Christian church are merely saying that the first mark of the Christian church must be genuinely upheld. Yes. The word teaches us to use the sacraments and teaches us what they mean. And the sacraments are only legitimately used if the discipline and order of the church ensures that they're used as the word tells you to. So these, these are not really three separate marks of the church. They are one mark of the church properly, genuinely exhibited and lived out. Mm. And so it is very serious, I felt, when... when when the, when, when the House of Bishops permit ministers to repurpose a sacrament as they did with their 2019 Advent guidance. 
slipped out, as any clever political institution will do during Advent, when ministers are very busy doing other stuff, of course. I, and I remember shortly before that, they made financial resources available uh, for resource churches, I remember right. that that happened a couple of months before this yes, came out. Yes, yes, that's right. That's where they right, would yes, give from church house, right. gave some extra money. That's right. And then a couple of months later, you you received this money, and now there's this new transgender <laughs> that's right. approved by that's the House right. of that's Bishops. Right. That's right. It's a bit of a difficult situation. That's right. So well, so the so the Church of England, after the shared conversations, became a one big shared conversation. Really, it, it the shared conversations turned the Church of England into a church of plural truth. Mm -hmm where there are different views on these important issues and you're free to take different views so long as you accept their different views. And what the resource churches move demonstrated was that if you are prepared to play the plural truth game, you can be paid and given money and your church can be helped to become more successful because you will be given resources from this very large wealthy institution which will just help you cope yes. in, in the times to come. And that's exactly what happened. So the, the resource churches included some of the biggest evangelical and conservative churches in the Church of England, but also some of the most liberal churches. Yeah. And you can have the money, which can pay for a staff member in your team, and you can tell people in your church, isn't it great? We're growing. We've got a staff team. We're able to do this good gospel work. But a price has been paid. You have embraced plural truth. Many ministers in South Africa, where, where I originate from, they also sit with the, the difficulty of having, you know, uh, parsonages, they've got church buildings, mm. they've got you know, yep. a pension pot, they get all these benefits. Uh, and if they would realign with another church or, st or plant a church, mm. they stand to lose basically all of that. I remember yeah. we live in the Southampton area and uh, there are some deprived areas where I've mm. known some vicars who, if you look at the contribution that the, the parishioners make, it's substantially less That's than right. what they receive from church house. So if you're in a position like yep. that, where you're your your stipend is yes. paid by church house and you are asked to stand for the gospel it, it makes it much more difficult yeah so now you're raising you know you raise the issue of the resource churches that's sort of the big picture money thing you know the average person even in one of those churches doesn't really follow the details of that but then you come down to the local church of a smaller normal type church and and you find the money issue raises its head again in a much more painful and agonizing mm. way yeah so my recollection from when I was in the Church of England was that in my diocese, the Diocese of Rochester, um, pretty much half of the churches in the diocese were not collecting in from their congregation enough money to pay the costs of their minister. Um, so across the Church of England, there is that problem of sort of lack of financial realism. It's one of the reasons why um, there's a move in the Church of England to sort of amalgamate parishes have one minister overseeing 10. There's one minister who oversees 14 churches in the Church of England, oversee a group of churches and have unpaid people looking after things underneath that. So there is the, that financial pressure. And if you're a church minister and your conscience begins to awaken to the idea that you need to leave the Church of England in order to be faithful, um, there's many challenges and many problems and money's one of them. So you would need to work out, um, is there a way to provide an alternative ministry for people in my area? Are there people that would even want it? Um, if not, then the Bible mm. has other things to say about what you do when the gospel is no longer wanted. Sure. But um, you would need to explore other ways to finance and fund this. And one of my great disappointments about the evangelical movement in England is that after, not just me, but many other people, warning them what was coming, um, there was a moment when we could have used our considerable financial resources as, as a large network to make an offer to people to say, look, if you want to leave the Church of England and set up a church nearby with people who want to benefit from your ministry, of course, you're going to have to have a different kind of building. Of course, you're not going to be as comfortable as you were. But we could have put together a funding package to at least give people a serious opportunity to make that happen. You know, we could have helped one another. Why didn't that work? I think because there were too many evangelicals wanting to believe that they could stay. And transform from the inside. Some people arguing that, but I would say that the majority of voices that had weight would come from the older age spectrum, men in their late 50s and early 60s, who privately said to me, you know, we're staying until we retire no matter what. And then they kind of, map that onto the movement and sort of encourage other people that it'll be okay, you can keep going, 
but they know they're going to take early retirement and and they but it encouraging all the younger men to stay is part of what justifies them staying until they retire in a short time what and so they, yeah, we're all engaged with, in a yeah. but what do they do with, i mean your book that you wrote a few years ago um you know what do you do with ephesians 5 to separate from from those who do these things oh, from thinking, Romans 16 to 17 do not be partners with what do yeah, they do yeah, yeah. with those texts you're, th you're thinking of the, the Bible theft book that, so right. that, that book was a collection of sermons I preached in our church on, on passages in the New Testament that tell us how to respond to false teaching and I think I think there's a lot of fancy footwork I think you know and, and you know fancy footwork over New Testament texts combined with not letting people in the pew really know what's going on mm. combined with rhetoric about the positive hopes of of how we could transform the church of england and win it from within and you know a few more votes one more push you know but it's it it ha it, it's awfully you know it's like there's nobody in charge who's any real military knowledge or experience or knowledge of history you know yeah. you know it, it's like you're all in the psalm and it's the officer saying, you know, you know, okay, well, the last five hundred people were all mowed down by machine guns, but one more push, and and we'll, and we'll change it. Oh, and wow, Let, let's let's change gears to you leave the Church of England. You start take take us back. It's more than three years now. You started yeah. with about how many twenty people. Uh, the whole process, uh, things you've learned in in the past three years, and and what's going on in the ministry today. So you raise the practicalities problem of money and finances and stuff and and you ha you cannot you cannot gain say that that being a minister in the church of england makes ministry very comfortable and very easy and 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 in the sense that you're given a lovely big house to live in so the minister's somewhere to live and it's paid for it's usually. you don't pay for it no the, mm. the church of england provides it um you're given a, a stipend, an mm. income, mm. which is very generous compared to many church ministers in the country today and, and in previous days. You have a building to meet in as a church, which again is very significant. In places like London mm. and Tunbridge Wells, that, that's a massive blessing where no property is expensive, pay, no rent to pay. It's, it's, mm. um, and you have a whole sort of legal set of structures around you as a charity and things mm. like that and bank accounts. That's all set pension up as well. And up. the minister has a pension provided as well. Mm. So if you are to leave, if you realise you need to leave, all of those things those things need to sort of, you need to work how all those things are going to be provided. Mm. Um, and um, for us, um, we just felt that the, the, the day may come when we need to leave the Church of England. We don't know when it will be. So we, we worked really hard to sort of pull all the resources we could get hold of from our own um, personal employment and family and managed to buy a house in Tunbridge Wells n near our church and just rented it out. Yes. And that's, that's like, that's, you know, the, if you're going to be a minister, you need to live somewhere. That's like, that's like one part of the equation has kind of been dealt with. So you kind of know if push comes to shove and we need to leave, at least we've got somewhere to go and live. You know, it's there at least. So we just did that and left it um, to, to bubble under the surface in a sense. Um, but then when the transgender baptism guidance came in in 2019, mm. I emailed the archdeacon to say, look, I'm going to be resigning. Mm. Be good to talk to you about the practicalities of how that happens. Diocese were very reasonable, to be honest, very decent. They, they understood and, might I say, respected it. They understood the consistency and the coherency of the position. Indeed, you know, more than one of the senior officials said to me, mm. we struggle to understand how so many of your friends and colleagues justify not doing what you're doing. Mm. Um, and they, they were very helpful. They were very reasonable. They let us stay in the vicarage for, you know, a number of months after they had to, as we sort of had to organize our housing. Um, they, they helped issue press statements that showed we weren't, being immature or silly we were you know being mature and growing yeah. up about the decisions you know mm. so i i take my hat off to them in a sense you know um uh, i appreciated that it was reasonable um we just um the thing we did was as as things began to degenerate uh, a church minister in the church of england shouldn't be doing ministry outside their parish the laws of the church of england would really forbid that mm -hmm. so we set up a little evening service in our parish which was just a little evening service mm. But around that, we set up the legal sort of charity trustees you need and bank accounts you'd need if it were a full-fledged church mm. 
you know, you'd need all this stuff. So we set that up and ran in parallel for a while, right. for a year or so, maybe even two years alongside mm -hmm. the Church of England. Right. And again, that meant that when the time came to say we need to leave, we could literally just say to people, well, look, you know, for the last year or two, we've had this little evening service. From next Easter, we're going to make that a full-fledged church. Okay. We're going to find somewhere else to rent. We're going to meet somewhere else. So from this date, you know, your minister will be there running a morning service, an evening service. We'll still run a youth club, home groups. If you want to come with us, come along on the Sunday morning and, and join in. And it's, it was quite a nerve-wracking experience because you literally don't know who's going to turn up on that Sunday morning. Mm. The income and the viability of the church and your ministry is fully dependent upon the giving of the people. Whereas in the church of England, if the people don't bother giving, you know, you're still paid your stipend, you still have your house to live in. When you're an independent church minister, you know, the ministry and the viability is fully dependent upon the giving of the people. Um, and, you know, we were really moved and very um, astonished by the people who turned up and, and made it a viable little church. It was hard work. It remains hard work. But ministry is hard work. You know, uh, Jesus talks about that in Revelation 2. I know your hard work. Um, but three years on, it's a viable little independent church. Um, some of the people who were part of the original plant have moved on, retired, moved to other parts of the country. Um, new people have joined us. We had our, our annual general meeting a couple of weeks ago. We looked through the figures and realized that fully half of the people in the church are people who've joined us uh, since we set up and were never part of the Church of England. Oh, so that's people so, from outside, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Praise yeah, yeah. the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Including people from the estate that we live on, mm. um, people at different stages of their journey of faith. Um, Anybody who's come from a sceptical position and come to faith, that you yeah. can maybe encourage yeah. some of our listeners with that. Yeah, we had um, a lovely woman who heard us singing carols outside at the Christmas service a couple of years ago and came along and listened to the carols and then began coming to church service after church service and now openly trusts in the Lord Jesus. And, you know, I, I guess, humanly speaking, that person wouldn't have become a Christian if we weren't running this little church plant, which is made in an estate, you know, no longer part of the Church of England, uh, and there's others. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's very exciting. And, you know, I, I'm doing this interview with you now about the Church of England, and, and I'm grappling to sort of scratch around my head for the dates and the figures and the numbers, because, of course, you know, I, I'm no longer a Church of England minister. I'm a Christian minister, but I, we don't wake up every day thinking, what's Church of England done today? We just do ministry. And um, uh, the book chapter that InterVarsity Press are publishing about us leaving the Church of England, you know, I wrote that several years ago. Oh, you know, and okay. it, I think the publication of the book was delayed because of COVID and things like that. So let's do two more quotes from that chapter. Um, my future hope. God is sifting his church to see who genuinely loves Jesus and is willing to do ministry in ways that are Jesus-shaped and counter-cultural. Mm. Can you reflect on that three years on? Yes, well, I... When I left the Church of England, I thought that the issue is the need to leave the Church of England. You know, that, that clearly there's an imperative when you read the New Testament on how Jesus wants us to respond to false teaching and what's actually happening in the Church of England. There's an imperative from the need to protect the sheep and look after them, that, you know, if we don't provide a way for them to be looked after and fed and taught outside the Church of England, you know they will in time be crushed. Um, crushed by the compromises the minister has to make to stay crushed by the institution as the teaching begins to permeate. Can I just intersect? Some of our friends say, no, 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 you get it wrong. You are abandoning your sheep by leaving them to the wolves. Hmm. They they do something with that analogy or metaphor that is yeah. something that we don't agree with. We, we, we feel that leaving them there is actually leaving them. Yeah. Uh, you know, they should come with us, with the shepherd come out from, yes. from them. Yes, it's the job of a faithful shepherd to lead and guide the sheep to safety. If you know that they're about to be crushed and mauled to death by false, by, by, by false shepherds and by wolves, you don't just say, well, this is where we've always been. This is where somebody else pays for us to have a building and pays for me to be. The shepherd must, if necessary, at his own cost, lead them to safety. And, and that's why, you know, we in our context, set up a new church five minutes walk from the Church of England Church. So if, if, if the sheep want to be safe, they just have to turn right instead of left when they come down the street and walk five extra minutes and, and you're there. So provide an opportunity to be safe. That, that, I think, is looking after the sheep. Staying where you know they're going to be harmed just because it's where you've always been, 
that's not good shepherding. Yeah. Now, the quote that you read there, um, it's interesting that three years on, I feel that to be more strongly true than I understood at the time, that in the real sense, the issue is not just the Church of England. One's ability to respond to the false teaching in the Church of England and the institutional orientation around it is actually merely the test case for the much bigger spiritual missional challenge of being faithful in terms of reaching out to and evangelizing uh, the uh, woke, uh, aggressively um, sort of critical culture that that deeply believes it in a self-righteous way that its views are are the only ones to be tolerated on a host of issues then in a very real sense you have to you have to be able to navigate and deal with the problems the church of england is presenting you because they are merely a subsection of merely even a test case for dealing with the tsunami that's coming Mm. of an, an aggressive woke culture which has very strong views on, on race, on sexuality, mm. on, on what it means to, to live with integrity. And, that, and that, that is increasingly allied with laws and authoritarian government structures, which will enforce that in schools, on families, on churches. Mm. So in a very real sense, yeah. the spiritual cultural issues of our day mm. are what Christian ministers really need to take the lead on. Being able to navigate the Church of England and find a way to deal with that, mm. that is merely the test case for something much, much harder. Fail at that, yeah. the Church of England, you, you will really struggle with what's coming. Yeah, and, and since you left, we've seen a, a number of other very high-profile resignations from the Church of England as well and persecution of, of evangelicals. Mm. Um, well, I think, you know, the, this, the decision to establish Emmanuel Church in Tunbridge Wells and to leave the Church of England was not my decision alone. I think the leadership team who collectively agreed that that is what should be done to protect Mm -hmm. the sheep and provide for the future. I think that the last three years events have demonstrated them to have been right in that decision. We are safer. We are freer. Mm -hmm. Our future is more secure now outside the church of England than it was when we were in it. Yeah. Let's, let's finish with a a, a nice quote here at the end. And then I'm going to ask you to read a piece of scripture for us. Your last paragraph For those who become convinced the established church has so compromised with the culture that it can no longer credibly guard the message of redemption from sin, God will provide lifeboats that can enable clear blue water to be placed between them and the Church of England. I can assure any who find themselves convicted that they must take that path. It will be incredibly painful and opposed by many. Friendships will be lost as others are gained. Still, the spiritual rewards and realities experienced will be immense. Yeah. yeah. Well, all I, all I can say is that that's true. The, um, the Christian ministry is a, is a supernatural work of God, which we, we merely participate in in a very small way. Um, and the, the costs and the effort that were required in, in setting up a new church outside the Church of England were considerable. Um, and you certainly lose a lot of friends with, without a doubt. You know, I, you know, the, you know, before we left the Church of England, you know, 350 to 400 Christmas cards, you know, Christmas after we left the Church of England, barely needed a small shelf. Um, which, which does, you know, and I've heard there's some other ministers who've left the Church of England, it does raise a question that the evangelical movement in the Church of England, how strong are the bonds, really? Mm. The friendships, the relationships. Is it really about Christian ministry and Christian fellowship? Or or were we more affected by the Church of England than we cared to realise that actually we're all in it together so long as we stay in the Church of England? Um, it's like a club. Yeah. So, so if we can wrap up, uh, Peter, would you mind... Uh, Speak to some of our friends who are really wrestling with their conscience. And not just Church of England, maybe other Protestant denominations in the States, in South Africa, mm. who have to, they know they have to make a decision fairly yeah. soon. Could you maybe share one or two texts from Scripture that is really significant for that decision? And then would you mind to do a prayer for those mm. ministers who, who will really benefit from this conversation today? Yeah. Well, I think um, 
the big the big lesson or warning that you, you know you can share to people in in this situation around the world is that um the trajectory for institutions that begin down the path of compromise on these issues is almost always to get worse and worse and worse. It is possible at junctures to turn institutions around, um, but you don't have to have a, a supernatural level of insight to see whether or not that point has been crossed. You look at the Church of England, it's very clear the point has been crossed, and you can see that the agenda has been set now for a good decade on holding together in diversity, plural truth, a big shared conversation. And I would say that in October, November this year, probably, there will be some kind of paper will come out from the Church of England where they will um, they will commend the church's mission as being a way of showing the world that we are united in diversity, that we have different views, we hold together in love. Mm. Um, and then beyond that, next year, there will be some kind of way to express with very technical legal language a a form of celebrating or blessing a same-sex relationship without using the certain legal phrases and terms which would fall foul of certain challenges so it'll all be about finding a technical way to phrase things such that it can happen but evangelicals if they want to can be encouraged to say well it's not really happening and it's all about trying to convince people that what you know is happening is not really happening, uh, stick with us, it'll all be okay. But actually under the surface it does happen and it become more and more apparent. Mm. So I would say whatever your institution is, if you're grappling with these issues, you have to look at what's happened in the past, look at what's happening and where it's going. And, and the sooner you make a move, the sooner you begin to prepare, the better it will be. And the... The verse that other people repeatedly mentioned to me as I was in the process of providing for our mm. people mm. to leave was the verse from Samuel uh, that the Lord honours those who honour him. Mm. And I'm not exaggerating to say at least five people shared that verse to me independent of one another. You know, they share one verse and that's the verse they share. The Lord honours those who honour me. And we find it to be true. You know, it has been a joy to serve the gospel, to see people come to faith, to, to, to pastor and counsel. Um, knowing that one of the greatest challenges of our time has, in our small little corner of the vineyard, has been dealt with, and people can be a part of a church that know it's been dealt with, and and know that the leadership of their church will back them and support them when they have to deal with it in whatever context they live and serve. Because people across the Western world are dealing with these issues. You get the phone call from the HR department. We'd like an informal chat with you about something you said on Facebook. You know. The HR departments never have an informal chat. It's always formal. Your job's on the line. That's happening to people all across the Western world in businesses and banks and hospitals. And the ministers who have dealt with the issue in their own context, whatever denomination you're a member of, they are the ones who will be able to counsel and help and support the people who are going through the mill in, in, in the Western world. Peter, thank you so much. Uh, can I ask you to do a, a prayer for those course, who would really benefit from the course. conversation? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, know that you are the you are the Lord of the Church. You are the one who cares for your flock. You, in the person of your Son, uh, bled for your Church and laid down your life for your Church. And Lord, we pray that you would protect your sheep. Uh, we pray even that you would gather and call uh, more people to worship you, to come to see that you are the Lord who always speaks truth and always does good to those who humbly confess their sins and trust in you. Lord, we pray for any who listen to this interview. We pray that any who are pondering these issues in their own organisations or denominations or even the Church of England, uh, we pray that you would give insight, uh, courage, faith. And Lord, we pray that you would guide and lead. Uh, we pray that your ministers, uh, those that you call and appoint to lead your church, we pray that they would listen for you and to you. And when they hear your voice, uh, they would follow and they would obey. And Lord, may the blessings be great, even in the midst of trial and suffering. Amen. Thank you so Amen. much, my brother. Thank you for such a wonderful encouragement. <laughs> Thank you.